Coming up, Robert Lewis, the storyteller, tells us his story and where some of his legends come from. When I was growing up, I would hear stories from my dad. He would tell stories about the coyote or bear. Plus, this is a cedar tree, and we call it a gin. Cherokee National Treasure Betty Frog, teaching the Cherokee language and the next generation of culture keepers. And finally, from small town Oklahoma to the center of attention as a Division I college quarterback, Mason Fine sets his goals even higher. You can tell as soon as you walk out that locker room onto the football field, you think you're dreaming. You know, all those fans right there, you know, the crowd, the noise, just makes it all worth it. The Cherokees. A thriving American Indian tribe. Our history. Our culture. Our people. Our future. The principles of a historic nation sewn into the fabric of a modern world. Hundreds of thousands strong. Learning, growing, succeeding, and steadfast. In the past, we have persevered through struggle. But the future is ours to write. OCO. 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 These are the voices of the Cherokee people. OCO. I'm Principal Chief Bill John Baker. Welcome to the Cherokee Nation and OCO TV. This is how we share our culture, our heritage, our history, and our language with you. What do? OCO, it's how we say hello in Cherokee. I'm your host, Jennifer Lauren, in the historic Capitol Square of the Cherokee Nation. This was the site of the International Indian Council of 1843. At the time, it was the largest ever gathering of its kind. We'll have more on that later in the show. But first, Robert Lewis is a beloved Cherokee storyteller. And while his traditional stories are well known around the Cherokee Nation, his own life story is not. As you'll see here, storytelling is a family pastime that is now Robert's preferred means of expression. My name is Robert Lewis. I'm a storyteller. That's me. They wanted to hear about my life, how I grew up, and how I became a storyteller. So, Robert Lewis, Tell us where you were born, who your parents are. It's pretty simple, really. Pull up a chair and I'll tell you. I was born here in Oklahoma at the Clamore Indian Hospital on October 10th, 1965. My mother is Cherokee, Lou Eileen Kingfisher Lewis. My father is Jazzy Lewis. He's Navajo and Apache. Born on a sand dune in Arizona, so when my dad was about 16, he ended up being adopted to a family in Tulsa. He stayed with them for a little while, and then they left him. So he made his own way from there, doing odd jobs and boot repairs. That's when he met my mom at a bus stop in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and they got married soon after. Mom always wanted to have little girls. Girls are important in our society because Cherokee women passed down the clan lineage. But instead, she had four boys, and she was happy with a big family. There's Philip, John Mark, myself, and Paul. Paul's the youngest. We all graduated from high school and turned out the way we were supposed to. At least that's what my dad says. Third one, he wanted to be an artist, and that was me. Because I love art, I love painting, I love drawing. I would draw on everything. I just kind of scrap, I would draw on it. And as I got older, I got better and better at it. We grew up in Salina, a little bitty town in northeastern Oklahoma in Cherokee country. They recently just got a stoplight. Living in a small town, you could walk 10 minutes and be anywhere you needed to go. So I walked everywhere. I never got my driver's license. No, I just got rides to places if I needed to go. And then the nation called and says, we'd like to offer you this job. I said, oh, it involves travel. I like that. Okay, you can do storytelling and uh, cultural programs. I like that even better. And then it says, nobody's gonna show for you. You have to get a license, you gotta drive. So after years of not driving, I'm getting back into a car, hand are shaking. It's a fear of driving. Anybody has a fear of snakes, spiders, heights, planes, some type of fear that people have talking in front of anybody's deep water. Uh, that's basically magnified when I was sitting in front of that car. And I get the job in the first big city I'm sent to by the Cherokee Nation after I finally get a license is LA. 
So after not driving for years, I'm pulling out of a parking lot in LA in a rental car. I said, okay, just drive like they do. <laughs> Drove out there, got in LA, and so I'm dodging, I'm weaving, I'm doing 80, 90, I'm falling on the flow of traffic. After about two or three days, I said, oh, I like this. I can do this. I'm whipping around with everybody. And then when I get back to Tulsa, I come barreling out of there at like 90 miles an hour at Tulsa Airport. And I realize everybody's driving slow. Now it's 55. And then I'm like, flare like a turtle. And after that, my fear of driving was gone. So, so your fears can go away. See, you can learn a lot about a person by listening to their stories. When I was growing up, I would hear stories from my dad. He would tell stories about the coyote or bear, and I'd listen to that. Uh, we went to a trip to Arizona, stopped at the Panhandle of Texas, and the stars were showing up, and, and so I'm sitting there looking at all the stars, and they're beautiful. And my dad looked at me and says, do you know how the stars got up in the sky? And I said, big bang, big ball of dust went up. And he said, no, sit down. And then he told me a story about how the coyote put up stars up in the sky. And then uh, the coyote wanted his portrait better than anybody else's, but couldn't make it just right. So he got frustrated and flung them. And they were scattered across the sky. My dad said, if you look up hard enough, you can see them. You can see a bear, you can see a wolf, deer, people, scorpion, but you gotta look for them. So uh, the creator, to remind the coyote, you finish what you start, put the moon up in the sky. So when the coyote looks up, sees the moon and sun, the creator says, you have to sing to me. So this is why coyotes howl at dawn and dusk and why your stars are scattered across the sky. So I heard this story, I was seven years of age, on this trip to Arizona, and then I got back in the car. My dad probably just thought he just told a story and driving the car, didn't think much about it. But I'm the one that's asking him all these questions. Which animal did the coyote put up first? He says, what's the moon up there for again? And I was just getting all this information so that I could have the story to myself. Well, life goes on. And as I got older, I had a few jobs here and there and ended up working at the Cherokee Heritage Center. So then I started going out and I started gathering all these other stories. They started offering me storytelling at the Heritage Center as part of the things. You can go learn, play stickball with the kids, do marbles with the sticks. We have a storyteller. And it became popular because I would pull people out to involve them in the story. Um, I would pull them out to get them interested in it. And I discovered something. When I pulled them out to involve them with the story, picking one kid to be the wolf, one kid to be the bear, one kid to be a chipmunk, whatever the story was, those kids would remember it. And a year would go by and they'd see me again and say, hey, you're the storyteller. They didn't remember my name. You're the storyteller. Now I travel around the 14 counties of the Cherokee Nation and throughout Oklahoma and the country telling stories. There's some stories about Kanati, the first hunter, and Selu, and those have been passed down. They're so old, we don't know how old they are. I tell the story of the great crawdad, another one about the rabbit who won't be quiet. And there's one about the medicine possum or the fire story that tells how all the animals got burned. All of the stories are teaching the kids something, how things came to be, how to be a better person, how to be more understanding of people who are different, that sort of stuff. They have meaning and the stories are a part of who I am and who we are and how we came to be here together. So there you go. That's my story. Well done. Betty Frog is one of the treasured instructors working at the Cherokee Immersion School to teach our children how to speak Chalagi, the Cherokee language. But Betty does more than just teach the language. She's also teaching our culture to the next generation of Cherokee culture keepers. Hey, let's do this one. This is a cedar tree and we call it Ajin. Say, all Ajin. lessons learned are not Ajin. from books. Ajin. There's more knowledge out there than just in books. Basically what I'm trying to do is learn everything. You know, I do baskets, I do um, round read, flat read, I do uh, 1700 clothing, moccasins, twine bags, like my ancestors, you know, it's a way of life. They made things when they needed it. My name is Betty Christy Frog. 
My tricky name is Gehuneg. I was named after my grandmother, and I'm a first language speaker, and I'm also a second grade teacher at the Cherokee Nation Immersion School. I, I never thought about being a teacher. It just came uh, natural, and I always loved it, working with kids. Squeeze the dead dog cross. Several years ago, they said our language was dying. People have been trying to bring our language back, and I think, like everybody says, the children are our future. And these are the children that are going to be speaking Cherokee. I'm passing on language. I'm passing on a little bit of tradition and culture. Um, it's a good feeling. Yeah, this is where we were digging onions. Of course, a lot of, some people think that's an onion, that's garlic. I think uh, students could learn a lot just uh, walking in the woods and talking about it, what kind of tree it is, what falls off of it. You know, the hickory nuts used for making kanachi, which is one of the Cherokee favorites. There's just all kinds of stuff that you can learn. I mean, it's just, it's all here. I mean, that's what our people used to survive on. I guess uh, I, I like to be outside because I grew up playing outside. We were all brought up speaking Cherokee. I was probably the last one in my family to go to boarding school. That's where I learned to speak English. When we got to come home, it was all Cherokee. I very rarely heard my dad uh, speak English. Talk to me in Jaleke Huwoni. Jalegohuwani has to just speak Cherokee. I, I don't know. It was like, it was like he he knew that if I used the language, he, he told me he said one of these days you would use your language to help people out. <laughs> Most of the land around here did belong to the Christie family. To some people, it doesn't mean that much, but to me, it means a lot to have the originally allotted land that was allotted to my grandfather. I want, truly want to hang on to what I've got, and um, hopefully my children will feel the same way. You know, it was something that was ours. I have five children. I have four boys and one girl. I have 12 grandchildren nine girls and three boys. I was a single mom, and I'm proud of the way my kids turned out. I've tried to teach them. I've tried to teach everybody, all my grandkids. They all know how to dig wild onions and clean them too. Uh, they, don't, they like to go hunt for mushrooms. My grandparents, on my mom's side, uh, they used to make baskets. I remember watching them make baskets. When I saw them doing it, I thought that is really interesting. And uh, the older I got, I, I learned, I learned. The flat reed is my favorite because it has patterns. And I have taught my uh, daughter my sister, my niece, my granddaughters, and they can all make baskets. My grandsons, they all make baskets. When the grandkids see me doing something, they want to do it too. We usually work on anything they want to. I'll just ask them, what do you want to work on? That's what we'll do. We'll sit and work, and yeah, we have fun. I was like, it's like, like in a classroom, when the kids understand, I tell them, light bulb goes off, and you can see it in their eyes. Ost Agielaso Nu la ghost yga dash kwa Skin yo dash kwa No la kilo Ejie yo hosko Niga still used Ejie yo dash kwa Ost in yo dash kwa Niga kilo No le Ost yye yo ti yo I like learning new things when I learn something new, I want to learn everything about it, and I want to pass it on to somebody, but I don't want to pass it on until I learn all I can from it, and then I want to pass it on.
In 1843, after several Indian nations were forced to become new neighbors in Indian territory, Cherokee Chief John Ross called a historic meeting. The International Indian Council of 1843 lasted several days and was attended by about 20 tribal nations. This 2016 painting by artist Andy Thomas captures the fanfare of the event. It's housed at the Gilcrease Museum in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The International Council was the largest meeting of its kind ever held and took place in Tahlequah, the capital of the Cherokee Nation. Only a few first-hand accounts of the Council exist, including this painting by John Mick Stanley, a renowned artist of the time. So John Mick Stanley uh, was an American painter who traveled extremely widely. Uh, and he was working in uh, the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s. He traveled to Indian Territory from 1842 to 1845. And while he was there, he, he traveled to events like the International Indian Council. So this image here is a replica of John Mick Stanley's um, 1843 International Indian Council. The original painting is in the Smithsonian American Art Museum. He was there on site. So he was, this is his firsthand account. The Cherokee Principal Chief, John Ross, invited tribes from across the region to convene for this International Indian Council. There had been some conflict in the early 1840s, and John Ross's goal was to find a peaceful means to coexist and to share resources and live together in this place. The Reverend William H. Good was one attendee who recorded a detailed account of the council. Reverend Good describes the mix of cultures and the great variety in the looks and dress. The assemblage presented a motley appearance exhibiting every age, phase, and condition of Indian life of both sexes. The costume of the Indian tribes is greatly varied. Males and females fantastically ornamented, especially about the head, some with rich plumes, some with more common, and many with the single quill of a fowl. Almost everyone is distinguished by some article of display, the ears and noses, especially of the ruder tribes, variously and profusely ornamented. Reverend Good noted other tribal leaders in attendance, such as Potawatomi Chief Wabansi, Osage leader Zingawasa, Seminole Chief Wildcat or Kawakagi, Creek Chief Roly McIntosh, and Cherokees George Lowry, Jesse Bushyhead, and Joseph Van. There were also politicians from the United States in attendance, some captured in Stanley's painting. Uh, and in the middle here, you see uh, General Zachary Taylor, who was also present for the meeting. This is really uh, an incredible record. It's a, it's a beautiful work of art, but as a historic document and record of that event, it's really fantastic. And it's very different than many depictions of Native Americans from that time period, because this is showing a, a peaceful gathering. This is showing diplomacy, um, governance, Many depictions of Native Americans by white artists at that point were showing violence, were showing um, a very different, very stereotypical view um, from that era. William Good also transcribed Chief John Ross's historic welcoming speech. Brothers, by this removal, tribes hitherto distant from each other have become neighbors, and those hitherto unacquainted have become known to each other. Brothers, it is for renewing in the West, the ancient talk of our forefathers and of perpetuating forever the old pipe of peace and of extending them from nation to nation and of adopting such international laws as we may redress the wrongs done by the people of our respective nations to each other that you have been invited to attend the present council. The 1843 Indian Council was truly an international affair an unprecedented event for the time that set the stage for modern intertribal councils. Let's talk Cherokee. The Cherokee syllabary is the writing system invented by Sequoia. Each character represents a syllable in the Cherokee language. In this syllabary chart, the top row contains the six vowel sounds. The subsequent rows include the consonant sounds. Ni. Ni. Fourteen. Nigadu. Nigadu. No. No. Pine tree. No ji. No ji. Nu. 
Nu. Potato. Nu na. Nu na. 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 Moon. Na da. Na da. The frog swallowed the moon. Walo se. U ki se e. Na da. U sa e he. Walo se. U ki se e. Na da. U sa e he. Mason Fine is breaking records as a Division I quarterback and scholar-athlete at the University of North Texas. But the path to Mason's success has been hard fought and will continue to be as he sets his goals even higher. Homecoming on a day meant for football at Apogee Stadium, overcast, cool temperatures in the 60s, and a chance to nail down uncharted territory, the West Division Championship in Conference USA. Mason Fine continues to lead the league in passing. One yard from a thousand as he starts the day at 999 yards, third best in the conference with 13 touchdowns. This would have been unthinkable, but this is the opportunity that stretches out in front of the Mean Green players here this evening. Neither of my parents played high school sports. My dad didn't play football, basketball, none of that. I remember watching Adrian Peterson on TV. I told my dad, "That's what I want to. I want to go play football." I remember the first time I practiced. You know, I showed up for practice and I had my uh, pant pads on wrong. I think I had them upside down or something, and they were they were all over the place. So yeah, we, we were learning. We were learning. I had a natural act for throwing the football. And my dad saw that and you know, I wanted to be a quarterback and I wanted to you know, be a, a good quarterback. From then, it just kind of grew and kind of got better with how much work I put into it. When people tell me I'm just too, I'm too short or too small, I brush it off and I'm just like, all right, well one day I'll prove you wrong. I never doubted for a moment that I couldn't play Division I football. That, that thought never crossed my mind that I couldn't play at this level. And I always believed my, my purpose was to play a college football. You know, I always had that dream of playing Division I football. I didn't know where my next, my next step was. As that date approached, I feel like, you know, I was going to fail at that dream. That's a big thing when your whole life, those last seven years have been to accomplish something, you know, something you've wanted so bad and it might not happen. And I just really felt, <sighs> Real sad that you know my, this dream might not happen, and my dad just said, "Keep your head up. You know you don't you don't need tons of offers. You know you, you only go to one school. You only need one offer." Well, it was real culture shock coming from a small school to a, you know, a big university like this. And I really didn't have a whole lot of high expectations uh, from the coaching staff and even from people around here. They were really like, oh, who's this kid? Really came in here with a chip on my shoulder and uh, just kind of came out here and played my game. I practiced every day like you know, I was a starter. And so when that opportunity came, I felt mentally prepared for it and even physically. You know, second week in the season, you know, they announced me as a starter, just like that. I wouldn't be the person I am today if it wasn't for you know how tall I am or the stature because that developed a, a mentality and a persona of a chip on my shoulder of you know waking up every day and proving people wrong. I think if I was you know six foot two, 220 pounds, I don't think I'd be the same same person mentally. I don't because with all those people telling me I couldn't do something, developed some type of um, some type of mentality of waking up every day and proving those people wrong. Game day at Apogee, like a lot of energy, a lot of, a lot of people around. We actually stay in a hotel, so they, they bust us up here. Saturday morning, we wake up and we do a, we have a walkthrough. I wake up an hour before we have to get up for chapel. I, most people listen to music. For some reason, I listen to motivational videos. People today complain of lack of time. It's not lack of time that's the problem, it's the lack of direction. It really gets me uh, focused in and locked in, ready to go. As soon as you step off the bus, you just feel that excitement and all that energy from those fans coming here. You can tell as soon as you walk out that locker room onto the football field, you think you're dreaming. You know, all those fans right there, you know, the crowd, the noise, just makes it all worth it. Especially, you know, as a little kid, having that, that, that dream and 
you can just hear the, the, the speaker over the, the stadium and says, you know. And at quarterback, number six, Mason Fine. And for some reason, I always hear that. I, I, I tune out a lot of stuff during the game, but before the game starts, I always hear that. And that always puts a smile on my face. To be able to play that many people, you know, I never really thought of it as a kid, but now you know, I'm living out that dream. It just gives me a whole new energy, you, know, you can feel it. It really just kind of sets me, gets me ready mentally to, to play some football. I always know there's eyes on me, there's always people watching me. Being a divisional athlete, especially being the quarterback, I embrace that and uh, I kind of you know, live, my, live my day like, hey, there's always eyes on you, make sure you're representing this school, make sure you're representing your hometown. You know, being down here at Denton and being, being Cherokee is you know, something I really embrace, really enjoy uh, showing people, you know, my heritage. There's not a whole lot of Native Americans down here, so they didn't know if I was a, you know, Mexican or, you know, they, they, or they just didn't know. So, I, you know, I'd probably say, you know, I'm Cherokee, I'm, I'm Native American. I mean, my parents said when I came down here, just be who you are. And I'm just being who I am, and I know that's enough, and I was raised right. I just know if, I'm just, if I just be me, then that's, that, that'll be enough. I feel like I'm at a pedestal now that I can, I have the opportunity to speak to a lot of people and have a lot of influence on people to, um, to make a change for the better. And that's really, honestly, what I want to do with my life. I always have goals. And I think that's one thing I pride myself on is I always have goals. As a team, we want to, you know, I want to win conference. I want to win our ball game every year. You know, two years ago, this team went one and eleven, and now you know we're sitting at the top of our division, six and three. As we can accomplish a lot of things that haven't been accomplished here. I truly believe you got to have something to chase because you don't have nothing to chase. You're just going to become complacent. Before I leave here, I want to go down as a UNT Hall of Fame, and that's I, I'm chasing that every day. So when I wake up, I have that to chase. What do I have to do to leave here to be the greatest quarterback of all time here at North Texas? And Henry Wilson, Green Green, touchdown! And the celebration begins. The Mean Green are West Division champions for the first time since joining Conference USA. Every time I step foot on the field, I know there's always going to be people saying, why is this kid out here? I go out there and I try to prove people wrong and try to show the world you know, kind of what they missed out on. And I live every day like that, you know, wake up with that that mentality and I go out there and I attack each day and I don't let no one tell me I can't do something because that, that only fuels the fire and it just pushes me to do greater things. We hope you enjoyed our show. And remember, you can always watch entire episodes and share your favorite stories online at oco.tv. There is no Cherokee word for goodbye because we know we'll see you again. We say, Dota Dago Ha'i. Wado.